and your family left, and, and um, Mac was living in the house. Did you pack a lot of stuff up and just store it in the attic? And box um, just, you, you kept the furniture and that kind of thing? Oh, yeah. We, we kept everything the way it was. Right. <coughs> and then he kept running the farm, basically. He kept the farm operation. That's right. That's right. That's right. We had 10 acres of berries, and he reduced it to two, but at least he held on to the property for us, so. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna ask about another family. Uh, Sakahara family, do you remember? Sakamura. Sakamura, or is it Sakahara? Sakahara. Dan, Dan and Dan. Pauline yeah. Sakahara. Um, they were older than my brother, but younger than the first generation, like my folks. So, They were pretty, um, what can I say about Sakaharas? Um, they were sort of in between the old first generation and those of us who were second. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of like the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's the way I saw them as sort of the bridge. Um, but they're older than you were, but younger than your parents. Right. And, it's, and we had uh, Japanese language instructions, and um, Dan somehow figured prominently in this. Not that he was the teacher, but somehow participated in um, getting a Japanese language teacher from Seattle. And he and my dad worked together on that, getting a Japanese language teacher, so that kids like Hinichi and me and the other kids could learn the language. And so we had um, Japanese language classes on Saturdays and there was a house north of where our home was, and I don't think it's there anymore, but it was a place we lived while our house was being built. And it was an old house. There was a um, a well, um, so what was the question? I, 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 we, I started talking, um, getting you thinking about the Sakahara family, because um, one fun thing for us is a gentleman named David Perling from Los Angeles contacted us because he is the son of two well, um, he would be Dan's grandson, but um, his mother and his aunt were you know, an infant and three years old in the camp. And so David has been researching and his family oh. has lots of information you know, about them. Oh. Um, probably less information about their time on Bashan. So it's been, uh, he's been a great help to us. And we're talking about Dan Sakahara. Dan's grandson. Dan Sakahara was quite a um, quite a leader among the young young folks. Um, I think he lived. He and his family lived on. A, there were a series of houses, sort of halfway between. Vashon town and our place. Um, there were a series of great big trees 
on the uh, east side of the highway, opposite from where Dan and Pauline lived, and there were several houses there. Um, but I think Dan was, um, he took quite a bit of responsibility, leadership. Um, he was not real old, but he wasn't like Unichi in my generation. He was sort of in between. And he was sort of by default um, in the leadership role. So I don't know if that fits for anything. Were they, were they farmers? Was he a farmer? We're talking about Dan Sakaha. Dan You know, I don't really know mm -hmm. what he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, David said that when his family was in um, Cooley Lake, that Dan became a block leader um, uh, Could in Cooley Lake. So that sounds like him. Yeah. Sounds like him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Natural. So was he part of the um, the Japanese? He probably did, because he was one of the, the older Niseis. Um, and there were a variety of decisions that need to be made as we got closer to the war. Um, and I remember, gosh, I remember, you know, this, these signs that was put out by the um, army that gave notice that we were going to be evacuated on May 8, 1942. I think I have one of those. Do you really? I think I have well, one of those. For the necklace, if you find that sign, we would love to take a picture of that. Where would that be? I, I know I have one. I have one. That would be, it's very important for us that we have a, we don't have any, at the museum, we don't have a copy of it. We don't have any photographs. We've got photographs of other memorials in Puget Sound, but not that sign. I will try to dig that up and get it to you somehow. No, well, well, we can come here and take a photograph. Yeah. Well. Boy, you know, this is digging way down <laughs> deep, you know. Going back to when you were a kid. Yeah, well, that's true. I did when I was 19. I, <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's hard to remember. I think we're doing the same thing that you're doing. We're thinking, if someone asked me those questions, yeah. would I be able to remember as much well, as you're exactly. remembering? Probably. <laughs> uh, okay. A little bit about the, the Japanese school, the language school on, on Saturday. Okay. Um, was it mostly just young kids from that time and then mm -hmm. brought in instructors right. were from Seattle? And, and in what was that like? My dad, um, well, let me back up a minute. Mm -hmm. We, my dad um, would go to Seattle to the Japanese language school teachers mm -hmm. to see if they had any sons who would like to live on our farm to pick strawberries. Mm -hmm. And through that connection, he met these people, Sato, um, Yutaka Fujikado. Gee, these names come back. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Let's see. Nobu Sato, Yutaka Fujikado. Um, A 
I guess those are the two that really stand out. There were others um, because my mother would cook for them. And the barn was on our property. Since then, it was moved down to where, but it was by right on the, our pr property. And my dad had built this, well, it's kind of like a flat area, and they put mattresses down there. And this is where the, um, the boys, well, 14, 15, 16 year old boys who were sons of Japanese language teachers in Seattle would come and they would stay at our place the whole summer oh, really? through strawberries, um, boysenberry, currants, and they would sleep there and my mother would cook meals for them, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, we had <laughs> one bathtub in our house that really got a lot of good use. <laughs> All those boys and my brother and me and mama son and papa son, boy. You know, I have to say that my mother was an extraordinarily well um, disciplined, maybe that's the best word, mm -hmm. how she could cook meals for, <laughs> what, 13, 14 teenage boys. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> we would bring the picnic table and s set it up and the benches and at a certain time they'd come marching in and Mama son and I would put the food out and whoosh, boy, the food would disappear like crazy. <laughs> and And their parents, especially their mothers, would come over from Seattle on weekends bringing cookies and candy and stuff. <laughs> oh, gosh. Did they share any of that with you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I would help Mama San cook and talk about the big rice pan full of rice and salad from our garden, and meat from the meat store that was about a mile from the farm. My dad would go down there and he'd, I mean, it was quite a, <laughs> it was. And my mother and I would cook. We would do the dishes afterwards. And, oh, it wasn't anything fancy, but it was, good food and they they were <laughs> glad to get it and on weekends their parents especially the mothers would come and they'd bring candy and cookies and you know so that filled in all this <laughs> how many years did um, did your family do this oh, oh good heavens more than one huh like more than one year oh my goodness yes Year after year after year, yeah. Um, because we had strawberries and loganberries and gooseberries and currants and, I mean, we'd start in May, mid-May, go through July and into early August. And these boys, these are teenage boys, you know, and they had enormous appetites. And so Mama Sao would cook this great big pot of rice and this great big pan of okazu, you know, vegetables and rice, skiaki kind of thing, all mixed together. 
boy, those guys could eat. Yeah. <laughs> so did you have other pickers that worked um, as well? Yes, we did. We had um, um, Indians, American Indians. Uh, at one point, they uh, erected a teepee in our yard. I'd never been inside a teepee before, but that was interesting. Mm -hmm. That they did that one, one summer, mm -hmm. but um, most of the time, the boys came. They were sons of Japanese language teachers in Seattle, and that's how my dad recruited them. He met the teachers and invited them to send their sons over there, over to our farm, which, you know, they, and he put up a basketball hoop and we had baseball and bat and stuff. They could always walk a mile and go swimming, but after they'd worked hard all day long, they were in no mood to go down and walk uh, down to the water. <laughs> we invited them to do that, but my dad put up a basketball hoop on the garage door and bought, you know, they, they made all kinds of stuff, baseball and back and basketball and so. Yeah. <laughs> and ate. <laughs> and they did Work. eat. Boy, those guys ate. I never saw. <laughs> Boy, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Where did he find pickers? Well, he had a truck and he went all around the island and the word would get around that, that, and that you needed pickers and so they would agree to meet at such and such a corner and he'd go around and pick them up. And then there were people from Seattle who came across on the ferry and you know, she would go down with the truck and pick those people up and bring them to the farm. And so, you know, it, it, we always seem to have enough pickers. But of course, Papa San would buy these great big boxes of Babe Ruth, Butterfingers, butter balls, you know. And so every morning at 10 o'clock, Papa Song would have these, this three pound coffee can full of candy. And he would go around and he would give everyone candy. He was a popular guy. Oh, he was, he was. And it was interesting to note that after a while, Toke started doing that too. <laughs> word, word got around. <coughs> and so Papa San would buy these boxes of Butterfinger, Babe Ruth. You know, you buy these in wholesale places. So, <laughs> and they would always wait for him to come around with a three pound coffee can full of candy and he would drop it off. <laughs> so after the war, the Atukas came back and then and Toke, after he got out of service, right? He came back and took over the farm? Yeah. yeah. Do yeah. you know what happened to his two sisters? Haruko and I, um, we kept in touch. And one time, let's see, I had a car and I picked up Haruko and we went to, gosh sakes, we, we went to see Mary Matthews. Oh, really? Really? Oh, okay. When I we'll think about story. that, <laughs> that's the one yeah. one time yeah. I met Mary Matthews. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. 
is that one or whatever, whatever it was. I do remember picking her up. I had a car and Haros and I decided, let's go over to Vashon and we'll see Mary Matthews. And that's the one and only time I met her. Hmm. Did you ever know Mary Matthews? No, but I met her. You met her? Yeah. Well, this is going way back, you guys. I know. Huh? This is good stuff. Huh? Yeah. This is good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> this is good stuff. Yeah. Oh, I'm God. just amazed how good your memory is. You know, well. This is great. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask you um, uh, just a little more about the uh, Sukkis, because um, I actually know um, Pope's grandson, um, Robert. Oh, do you? quite the handsome and uh, sweet what? young man. Oh. Oh, really? I've oh, known him since he was tiny. Uh huh. I know his uh, uh -huh. his maternal grandmother. That would be so. Um, so my it makes wife, me interested in the family. My wife had uh, had Robert. My wife taught kindergarten in Vashon, and she had Robert in kindergarten. Oh my goodness! Oh my Robert. goodness! You know, I my folks are real close to the uh, Otskas, and uh, I remember going over from Seattle from time to time to see them. And there was this one tragic accident um, when Toke tried to start some machine and got clothes caught and he was killed. Yeah. I was there oh, on the farm at really? that oh, time. Wow. Yeah. And so I, I went and I saw what happened and I came back to the house and I called 911 and I said, we need an aid car here immediately. And so they did. And I think he was already dead by then, but um, Boy. Yeah. That that's in my memory, in my small memory. Uh -huh. Just bad. Because I, um, I, I keep remembering Robert as a six year old, his grandson riding around in the, on the tractor with Pope. Oh, and yeah. Robert loved the farm. Mm -hmm. And I think the two of them. Well, well. Well, my folks, especially my mother, was very fond of Mrs. Otska, and they were very, very close. So, um, I, you know, I have certain flashbacks to scenes with them. Um, yeah, just little vignettes. Of this, their farm was always right there as part of the Bashan. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 And uh, I don't remember where their farm was before them. Uh, yeah. That's the only record I can find. Of really? Of yeah. Uh, he did farm down on uh, Corsic Road. I was thinking was that. There, I think I was thinking that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. was right. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So what about the Hoshi's greenhouses? Were they mainly um, sort of vegetables and things in the greenhouse? What flowers. Flowers. Oh, flowers. flowers. Henry, Henry, that was Henry's project. <coughs> and I think there was something else that they grew, but the, the main memory I have is of Henry mm -hmm. and that greenhouse and the flowers mm. that he would take to the Pike Place Market uh, periodically. And I don't know how, you know, how that worked, but uh, I remember stopping at their place and recognizing the greenhouse and Henry 
taking off with a load of flowers or pots or something to catch a ferry to go to the Pike Place Market. That's more recent. Yeah. Yeah. And I just found a, um, a description, a beautiful description you wrote about the Moose Ice Garden. I actually sent it around to all of us who are part of Friends of Moose High just so we can picture in our minds what it once looked like. Oh. So do you remember um, spending time at the Moose High House and looking at that? Very much. My mother and Cooney were pretty good friends. And I remember spending time in their home, um, admiring their garden, walking up the, you know, the, she had it so beautifully made. So it was just like um, a mountain with steps and miniature trees and and then this moat around that had these koi fish that swam in there. She, uh, Cooney had done an extraordinary job of creating this garden. And periodically, like in the spring, when the cherry blossoms were in bloom, she would invite us to come and admire. And so I loved to, to walk up the, you know, there was a winding walkway up the mountain, and there were these trees. There was this moat with fish that swam in there. I thought, oh gosh. And I felt so fortunate that my folks and the Mukais, I don't know how close the Mukais were to the other families. I felt we were really fortunate because they took us uh, one time uh, in their car and we went to Mount Rainier. And I thought, oh boy, that was a real treat. Did you show the program, the talk, did the talk on Vashon? We have some photographs oh, of, gosh. of your families at Mount Rainier. That was very special. It was very, very special. And I felt very special. Um, so, so did you, did your family sell berries to the Mukai packing plant? Yeah, we did. Okay. We did. And, and most of the families on that yeah. did. Yeah, you know, right. Mm -hmm. Both whites and Japanese and all the farmers. Right, yeah. right. So. Did you ever go in the packing plant? I did. Um, I was curious how it ran. And so here we are, you know, the truck would come with this stack of flats of berries and a guy would come and wheel these over to a particular place and there would be a man who would take a flat and put it at the beginning of this, um, whatever you call it, um, anyway. He would go and the berries would flop into the water below and this, these would hold the flat and the boxes back while the berries drop into the water. And then there was some device for picking up these berries and then they would go along here and there would be women and girls stationed at different places picking up the green ones or the leaves or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. as the berries went along. So there wasn't and conveyor belts. Right, right. right. And then they would drop into this huge barrel. And there was a guy that was operating the lever so that there would be berries in this thing. And then something would pick up the berries and uh, he would control so, so that the berries would drop into the bucket, this huge bucket, 
and then he'd pull a lever and the sugar would drop and he'd pull that and then then the barrel would go over and that somebody else would take a, the lid. I mean, I, I can just see all this That's happening. happening. Wow. I mean, I was so impressed. <laughs> yeah. Was this when you were a kid? So this was before the war? Yeah. Yeah, yeah my folks took me. I wanted to see. I wanted to see. <laughs> yeah. Well, if we're lucky, someday um, maybe you'll get to see the house and hopefully the garden. Yes. Yes. Oh, boy. I guess they're really working on that, huh? We will be. We meaning who? Friends of Mukai. Yes. Yeah. You talk that the, this place matters, the ranch over here with the house, and they were out on the road there. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we did a great job. Oh. 